We're live. Yay. Hey, do you ever <laughs> upload uh, videos to YouTube with just your green screen in the background like that? Or do you always put like something back there? I normally put just a plain like background just like to make white? it look a bit nice. Like like white or something? Uh, normally like uh, turquoise because that looks nice with a sort of uh, orangey skin tone or whatever. Oh, right. But but do you ever like just upload like like as we are right now, just green, like natural? Um, not usually, no. Because you don't want people to edit it and draw a dick pointing yeah. at you? Dropping a rancor monster, like trying to eat me. <laughs> so people are going to have fun remixing this episode? I don't want to see any swear words. <laughs> <laughs> cool, man. Well, hey, thanks for uh, coming on, man. I know uh, what, what's really special about this episode right now is what you just told me right before we started, which I had no idea. I don't know if anyone has any idea, but what you just told me. Mm. Uh, and, yeah. and I can definitely relate um, with the fear of, you know, it's one thing to make a video, but there's another thing of like having a bad experience being live. Yeah. Right. And so like, I'm, I know most people are probably afraid of public speaking. In fact, public speaking is like the number one biggest fear yes have. isn't isn't the statistic most people would rather die than have yeah. to do public speaking but by yeah. the top fears yeah which, uh, like, and um, so yeah. Gr growing up oh briefly like what right before what you right before we went live what you told me was like going live kind of um you you had like a, a panic attack as a, as a kid growing up right? you were on live radio and you had a panic attack and you froze up um and now still to this day like somewhere in the back of your head like maybe there's like that fear that it might happen again or something is that right yeah, and, and it did happen fairly recently uh, during a live stream. I, did, I always used to enjoy live streaming with Gemma, but when it's me on my own, I feel like, oh, you sort of got to entertain, you know, you've got to have the answers. Mm -hmm. And the, I, I just get that trigger, like, oh, I could forget what I need to say. And then I have a, you know, was having a panic attack over it. But like I said to you, Ted, I've been doing the uh, Joe Dispenza Breaking the Habit of Being You meditation, where you imagine going through your day and you're waking up and you've had that thought, and then you have that panic attack and you, you know that feeling in your body and you say change like you try not to follow that thought loop and then you do it like oh you're cycling along well he says you're driving along but i don't have a car you're cycling along you're thinking oh i'm talking at the camp out oh i could forget my lines and every, i'm going to be really embarrassed and then your heart races but no before that stage you say change you're getting in bed to go to sleep at night you have that thought oh you know which will often leave keep you awake but no you just say change and you re I've not done the meditation for a while. I don't know if you've done it, Ted, but I think you re you play it through like you're going to really thrive and whatever. Do you and you, like you reprogram that kind of uh, yeah. what do they call it? Like a neural 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 pathway. Yeah, like it's neural neuroplasticity, isn't it? Oh, yeah. And yeah, you're just rewiring yourself to be a winner. I mean, when I used to coach fighters, when I'd be coaching them on strength and conditioning, when they're really knackered at the end of a round or whatever, or sometimes I take them on the pads. And when they were really knackered and they're all done, I tell them, no, walk around like this, like you've just won, like you're a winner. And the way, and also the way we pose and poise, that has an effect on our on our emotions, doesn't it? It works both ways. If we're feeling a bit nervous and anxious and we don't really want the world to see us, you know, but just by making ourselves look confident, it can change our state. And if I can do it, bloody anyone can. So get on with it, live your, live your purpose. That's what I, I love say. it, man. I love it. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's truly all in your head, right? Like I read a great book growing up. It was one of like the, the first books I ever read that made my mind go. And it was called the brain that changes itself. Okay. And it's all about neuroplasticity. And this was written, right. I think in like, I could be wrong, but like early mid two thousands, probably early two thousands. Cause I feel like I read it when I was like 15, 16 or something. It was like the first, wow. Like, First, like that's um, a good um, age to start expanding your consciousness. Yeah, I it, was love like it. Non, it was like my first nonfiction book, and I was like, "This wow. is so cool! The brain changes itself." I didn't know that. I thought you just are the way you are, and that's just the way you yes. are. But then this book was talking about how if you visualize writing your name, right, just signing your name, do it with me here. Close your eyes, visualize writing your name. Okay, it's it's pretty easy, right? Like just yeah. draw your name, T E D, or you would be P A U L. You can do that easily, right? Mm -hmm. No problem. Now close your eyes and do it with your left hand. Oh, do, do you feel that awkwardness? Yuck. Oh. Okay, it's really awkward, right? Well, I didn't like that at all. Yeah, but here's the thing. 
<laughs> if you practice that every day, it's just in your head without even taking pen to paper. You just practice it in your head every day, writing your name like that. Yeah. And then like a week or two goes by and then you actually do it. It's, yeah. it's easy. You it's just like it. you've been drilling it in real life. Yeah, you can reprogram how you how you write it, how you draw with your left I can, hand. I can completely believe it. I might try it as an experiment. That's well, really that's, interesting. That's like a micro example of what Joe Dispenza is helping you do, right? Yes. With this long day, hour long meditation, whatever. It's um, such a long meditation. So worth is, it. Though. Yeah, this is just like a short example of like, look, just draw your freaking name with your left hand or your right hand, whatever, your opposite hand. And yeah. they did another study. This is a famous study where they took three groups of basketball players and they got one group, or they're not, sorry, not basketball players, three groups of non-basketball players. And they got one group to physically practice doing the, the free point shot. Yeah. The, 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 the free throw. Practice that every day for like, I don't know, three months or something. Another group just did nothing for three months. They, they, they did a baseline test on day one and then did nothing for three months. All right. So these are the control group. Yep. And then they had another group that just practiced in their mind. They just mm -hmm. visualized shooting the ball. Yeah. Now, at the end of the three months, the group that didn't practice at all made no improvements. They were the same as they were three months earlier with no practice. But the group that actually practiced improved just as much as the group that just practiced in their minds. Wow. Isn't I can that quite believe insane? It. I can quite believe it. That's insane. Whether you believe you can or you believe you can't, you're right. I don't know who said that, but I love that quote. I think it was Henry Ford. Henry Ford, was it? Good, yeah. You're teaching me something here. Yeah. So, and, and, that, and just, that just goes to show like how being obsessed with things really helps you make progress in it. Because even when you're not doing the thing, you're thinking about it. Yeah. You know? Like you go watch Michael Jordan play basketball and you watch his highlight clips or whatever, or like Steph Curry, whatever. You're like, these guys are so much better than the other NBA players. Right. But yeah. they're also so much more obsessed with basketball, you know, yeah. like you can watch yeah. a Kobe Bryant documentary and he talks about how, like, after the championships, everyone's out partying. Kobe's back in the court practicing. Yeah. Like he's obsessed. And so obsessed. even and you know, if someone's that obsessed, even when they're not playing basketball, they're thinking about it. Yeah, they're sleeping and drinking. I was the same so with karate when I was a lad. Uh, that was my life, uh, just training every day. I was coaching not well early, and I was constantly thinking about it. You know, I'm in the tanning salon trying to get a, a tan, and I'm going through my kata in my head, so I'm remembering all 24 of these kata. Dude. And, um, yeah, and I, and I just accelerated so quick. But from a non-sporty background, I was such a weedy kid, right. so unfit, so weak. But I just liked the idea of being fitter more than I liked the idea, you know, going through the pain of that rather than the pain, you know, I was quite, um, quite weedy, I, you know, I was easily intimidated by other kids, and I didn't like it. So <laughs> then there's that phrase, sweat more in practice, bleed less in battle, the pain of changing seemed less painful than the pain of remaining the same. So sweat more in practice, bleed less in battle. How cool is that? I love it, man. That's powerful. That's right? a dope one. I, I, yeah. the, I only I had to, I heard a similar one. It was just it was just train hard, win easy. Yeah, same um, thing, but not but I quite. Like, same I like yours. Visual. Yours is yours is more graphic. Yeah, so yeah I love that training, so much. Lead less in battle. That's yeah. I, I'm gonna take that one. I like that. Um, right. So, so you said you just said something interesting. You said like growing up, you were intimidated by the other kids, and you didn't like feeling intimidated by other kids. Mm. Were you around some bullies in high school or elementary school or something? Or um, just through like, even infant. I remember my the first sort of thing infant school. Like some kids threatened me with like a little thumbtack you know a tiny little thing that you wouldn't care about now but I just really scared I thought oh people can like hurt you you know and um yeah I, you always get bullies don't you any any group of kids that's always the odd bully like that's just how it is growing up and um yeah but I just didn't know how to stand up for myself I got too intimidated you know I would I would like panic uh, and I didn't know physically how to protect myself and I was weak and I was you know I wasn't fit so I had to learn these, uh, I had to learn these skills. And it was a steep learning curve there, Ted. Let me tell you, it was a very steep learning curve. I, I used to think the same, what you just said. Everyone grew up experiencing bullies. But now that I'm older, I'm questioning that because maybe the bullies didn't have bullies. Maybe, mm. maybe the bullies never got to experience what it's like to be bullied. 
Maybe. I don't know so much. My sort of experience is that generally they've been bullied, perhaps by their dad or someone. Hmm. That's been... Oh, I mean, I'm not saying true. that it doesn't happen the other no, way. I can't true. speak can't speak for everybody but that's my understanding yeah. it'd be it'd be a cool uh, thing to do just go and like interview a few bullies yeah be like, be like hey how uh, list off like the like five main people in your life and tell me your relationship between them like have they bullied you in any way like that'd be interesting yeah. to find out that would yeah, be good. i'll be honest ted i'll put my hand up when i became a doorman i don't feel like i was a bully in the, the fact that i would only fight someone or you know get wrong with them if they were being out of order but it became my adrenaline sport and I used to look forward to getting hold wrong on, with hold people on. and so hold on, hold I kind what's, of... what's a doorman oh a uh, bouncer sorry oh yeah so uh, you're, a bouncer, you're a bouncer and you said you, you got some adrenaline you kind of hope yeah it became fight. my adrenaline sport the first time I got the better of someone and I stood up for myself um, I, that suddenly became my adrenaline sport. I basically threw this guy out on my own. There was no other doorman around. It was a horrible club. We had no radios. It was horrible how it went down. He basically punched this woman. She had a big welt on her chest. Uh, and then these two ladies said, oh, there he is. There was no other doorman around. I was like quite green. I was very new. Didn't know what to do. He had a glass in his hand. And so from my martial arts background, I, I hit him in the forearm, to which activates your fingers. So he dropped his glass. I put... Um, I think I put a shot into his face, but because I came from a karate back and I pulled my punch and he still stood there. I was used to like, you know, put like point fighting rather than so semi-contact with little tiny gloves rather than boxing gloves. Yeah. Um, so then I thought, oh, sugar, I better put some. So I put a couple of body shots in a bit harder, free him out of the door, managed out of a fight or managed to lock myself out. So I had to walk all the way around the club. But Ted, I walked back into that club and I felt about 10 feet tall. And instead of being nervous, my brain said, and these were the words, I won't swear on your life, but my brain said, who's effing next? And that was it. Like I kind of Whoa. turned into a, a bit of a monster in a way. But like I say, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go after someone unnecessarily. They had to yeah. you know, be doing something naughty in the club or staring at me or something, but it wouldn't take much provocation. Like I would use, you know, any, if any little excuse, I'd have to show someone how tough I was now. And wow. that's how I kind of became a bit of a bully. So that's my, the, there's one for your uh, little list of uh, how do people become bullies? I'm um, your first, I'm uh, your first applicant. Wow. <laughs> that's really interesting, man. Because before I ever spoke with you, I just, I was seeing your pictures forever. And before I spoke with you, I thought like, just looking at you, you, you seem like a fucking scary dude, dude. Like you got a black <laughs> muscle shirt, huge well, muscles, you. you got tattoos, you're fucking shaved. And it, you just, you kind of like, you look intimidating. Someone doesn't know who you are. Like yeah, if, if, you. If, if you didn't speak, I'd be like, I'd be afraid of you. But as soon yeah. as you open your mouth and talk, it <laughs> all goes away. Like this That's is like good. a big teddy bear. I'm pleased. And do you know now, when I see someone who looks like me now, I don't think he looks dangerous. I think he looks insecure. Oh, that's what I think. I think it's all um, armor so people don't <laughs> mess with you. That's what it was for me. Yeah. So, and in fact, I did, I think, were you talking to Tim Chief about plant medicines and things? Yeah. On his, so I had a bit of an experience. And I had the the uh, thought, oh, I'm shaving my head because I don't, I want to be scary to people. And I actually grew my hair out for a while, um, but then I, it just messy. And then now I shave it because I just prefer it short. Like, it's, but it's not to try and intimidate people anymore. So I'm glad you said I don't uh, come across as intimidating. Well, um, I mean, not <laughs> not not once the conversation starts. But um, prior yeah. to, I could see how people would be like afraid of you, man. Like you, I have to speak so softly to people who don't know me. I have to speak so softly; it's uh, ridiculous. I think, like, what are you doing? Like, I'm the biggest teddy bear. Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't harm a fly. You know, a vegan, for yeah. God's sake. Yeah. You know, and it was through veganism that I had this kind of spiritual reckoning, awakening, where I didn't want to hurt people anymore. Mm. I just thought, if I don't want to harm a chicken I've never met, if someone is rude to me, they stare at me or they say something rude, yeah. do I necessarily have to break their jaw and that they have a horrible like time of it and I perhaps end up in prison where I can't advocate for animals? Or can I think he's suffering, his suffering's mm. spilling over, can I forgive that? Can I step out of my ego long enough to forgive that? Hopefully he doesn't then pass that on to the next person and we just lessen the... 
yeah the, the negativity like the the just toxic masculinity like nonsense right. and start to actually heal the world instead of just being and it, it's from it's only it's from insecurity isn't it if I'm to react just because I'm insecure because I'm scared something worse will happen if I don't make an example but no I know I can look after myself now I can give love I can choose to be the bigger man and to be kind and uh, life's so much sweeter I'm just so happy now I was living in fear all the time I think we act out of either if we boil all the emotions down I think we've got love and fear I think that's the two basal emotions that we act out of and choose love man I get life's just so 10 times sweeter it's, it's beautiful Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> I didn't think we'd be chatting about this today. I thought we were talking about vegan stuff. <laughs> this is a great, this is a great chat, Ted. I'm enjoying yeah. it. <laughs> so, so, so before you got uh, as big and muscular as you are now, were you like the chubby kid in school or the skinny, Kitty. scrawny kid? I was a racing snake. What's a racing snake? Uh, just, just, uh, I guess it's uh, English vernacular. It just means skin, skinny, like li- lean and. Okay. Tall, like quite gangly, I suppose. Do you have pictures of when you were that skinny? Um, not handy. I think I've put before and afters on uh, YouTube before uh, and on my Instagram, possibly. I'll, uh, I'll, because, throw, I'll throw some up somewhere at some point. I don't think I've got access to anyone here. Anytime someone sees you here, you're just freaking jacked. And it'd be yeah. cool, it'd be cool to see a uh. A skinny Never version. Of it. It's hard to believe that you. I tell you, if you went down to the bottom of my Instagram, you'd see some skinnier ones. Oh, but if you scroll way down. The you'd you'd be uh, you you'd, you'd be all uh, the whole link <laughs> of you trying to get there. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> wow, cool man. So, um, right now, what are you uh, what are you doing mostly like throughout throughout the days? Like like what was an average day in life? You know. Uh, get up. I like an ice cold shower, Wim Hof style. I think that's amazing. Uh, often breath work, um, breakers, and then normally gym. I'll either do some bodybuilding or some cardio training, uh, lunch, and then I'm basically making content all the time, mostly YouTube videos, yeah. uh, the odd live stream, and um, that's about the size of it, really. Gemma obviously makes some content for, for sales purposes. So, like, um, you know, we've done our course, which you very kindly helped us with, and that's been going well. So anyone needs coaching on vegan businesses, hire my man here, because he's he made us, like, an extra 10 grand this last six months that we wouldn't have made had we not have done what he said. So thank <laughs> you. So, we, yeah, we make some content. We make some digital products together uh oh and we're practicing for our speech at the camp out which uh is exciting slash terrifying that might like i say there might be ten thousand in the audience so we're drilling our speech every day together wow you're actually doing a speech rather than just freestyling eh yeah yeah i wow. prefer that i much prefer that i've done a few wow. speeches at, at Dude, maybe speech. that's why you're freaking anxious because you gotta memorize freaking word for word personally yeah. and, and go for that if that works for you but personally what i would do i would have like a main topic, obviously, and then I'd break that topic into like three things. I'd be like, okay, let's say the topic is why you should spread the vegan message, right? And then I'd have like three sub reasons, and yeah, and then for the each bullet, of bullet point kind of thing, is that what you're yeah, and then and then well, the, and yeah, and, and then for each point, I would have like a little story to to tell for to 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 depict that point. Because stories are easy to remember to tell. You don't need to remember any facts. It's just you're telling People a story. Love People love stories. And they paint a right nice image of like what you're trying to get across. They're very memorable. And then there's no like stress of having to memorize shits. But maybe if you already have something written out. Um, yeah, you know, we've don't, been don't, drilling it. To, uh, it. We're just trying to really like um, just really over deliver and just. Wow. You know, uh, we're really looking. And I've, I've been leveraging your. Um, because we're telling our stories and then we're telling some case studies yep. and we're using your brutal before divine discovery well now and honestly the few people who have heard our speech have been jaw- jaws on the floor like impressed so thanks again like not only did you help me make an extra 10 grand this last six months but you helped me uh write a good speech that hopefully will get a bit of uh applause rather than uh rotten tomatoes <laughs> the camp out. Sweet, man. yeah yeah the the story framework is um it's huge isn't it it's huge and and it's so, it's so easy to implement so easy to plug into right? yes 
Yeah, it's just like, like a framework, isn't it? Like it's yeah. easy. You've got there. You've got their formula. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so I love it. So, so it sounds like you're living a pretty pretty simple life now. Like you said, you wake up, you you know, you do breath work, you do some cold showers, you do a little workout, you make content, and you you know, eat a bunch of food and work on your speech. Right. Yeah. Um, did you ever think that you'd be a content creator? No. Is that, is that, no. Does that still feel kind of weird? really weird i have to pinch myself every day i'm really living my dream and you know as a as a kid i thought that i was a bit thick what i've since learned is they weren't teaching me anything at school that i was interested in it was just that so it was bringing me no inspiration no joy no excitement no energy but you know following your life's purpose and saving people the planet the animals trying to put right what i did wrong in the past like that's just fuel and I can work all day long and like not get bored and just have so much drive and, and energy. And um, if I could say one thing to, to like a young, a younger person, my one bit of wisdom as an old man now, cause I'll be 50 in uh, a year and a half, half a century old, live your purpose, find your joy and do that for a living. And you never work a day in your life. I can't remember. You're good with your quotes. I can't remember who said that. Now, did, uh, <laughs> Michelangelo? Was it? I don't it's know. It's true. I... It's all true. Yeah. Find yeah. A, do a job you love and you never work a day in your life. I'm just having fun. I'm just having fun and getting paid for it and making friends. It's, it's beautiful. I, it's really profound what you said, too, how like in school you felt a bit dumb because you were focused on things that you didn't even care about. Yeah. Right? And so it makes you I would fall that asleep way. in class. I'll get told off so much. <laughs> yeah. I'd be falling asleep. I, Mrs. I think, Green would shout at me. <laughs> I think uh, a lot of people have certain symptoms in school that they don't have when they're doing what they love. Like one of the symptoms you said, mm. like fatigue in school, right? Yeah. For me, the symptom was like anxiety. And like I, I would remember, I would get hot flashes. Hot flashes would come over me, and it would feel like I would like feel wow. like someone would like turn on like a heat lamp in front of me as soon as the teacher would like explain a lesson in math and be like, "Okay, now go and do the lesson." All of a sudden, it'd be like, Bruh. and wow. I was like, I'd get so hot, and I'd be like, freaking out. I'm like, I can't do this. I'm stupid. I, I my brain can't comprehend what you just said, and wow. like, um, I remember feeling really really dumb in that in that class. And so, what I would want to do to overcome that anxiety is my then ADD would kick in and I would like get up and walk around the classroom and start talking to people and just I have to like you know flush it out and just do what I love to do which is you know just talk to people and hang out and um yeah and then people say oh that's ADD but like even my cousin growing up had was diagnosed with ADD and he had to take like medication for it but whenever he was playing like a video game he was seriously interested in or whatever he was writing or drawing or, or filming something creative. There yeah. was no ADD. It was pure focus. This is really interesting. Right. And so mm -hmm. for you feeling like you're, you're dumb in school for not knowing math or whatever, but then you go yeah. and start talking about veganism or you start writing a speech, all of a sudden you're a genius. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's smart, like, it? I, I think if anyone's feeling dumb or if they feel like they have ADD or they're chronically fatigued, I personally believe that that's just a symptom of not doing what you love to do. Uh, I'm in complete agreement. So now we're looking back. I don't feel like I failed school. I feel like school failed me. They should have yeah. found out like what I was good at, what I wanted to do. But I didn't even know then. I, I'm, I was middle aged before I discovered. So perhaps that I'm being a bit harsh on him. But well, so I I heard a similar story about a girl, and she had I don't know ADHD, ADD. Is that like a similar type um, yeah, thing? Yeah, same thing. And she um this this uh, the parents took her to a therapist. And they said, oh, we can't do anything with her. You know, she's uh, she just won't concentrate doing all stuff. And he had uh, he said he, he had music on and the little girl, he saw she was like sort of rhythmically. And he said, do you mind leaving the room a minute? I just want to chat to her on her own. And he said that as soon as the parents left the room, she got up and started dancing around. And he said he called them back in and he said, your little girl doesn't have ADD. She's a dancer. I love it. Yeah. So, I love it. Yeah, That's the should have ever heard, man. <laughs> I love that. That's so That's very deep. cool, isn't it? Find your joy and do that, and don't take any nonsense off of uh, 
so-called authority figures. <laughs> another cool, another cool insight into that story you just told me is, okay, so you, you said the parents got up and left, right? Mm -hmm. Was the doctor in the room when she started dancing, or did she? Was yeah. Alone? yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was like a psychotherapist type person, okay. or um, because uh, oftentimes, like when you, yeah, when your parents are gone, you behave differently, right? Yeah. And that, yeah, that, so. that, that, that can be the real you because when your parents are around, you're, you're kind of fitting into the, the, the mold of how you think you should behave yeah. right? based on your parents' expectations. You want to fit their expectations. Yeah. But when your parents leave, like I've never beatboxed in front of my dad, but whenever my dad would like leave, I would start beatboxing. I'd be like, yeah. but, but, like, I would just like make music. I would never make music in front of my dad. Cause like, yeah. I have like this thing where it's like, oh, my dad sees me as a certain type of person and same with my mom and same with, you know, whatever people in my family, but as soon as they leave, then I can like make music and just like be like more of who I am, you know? Yeah. 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 And so I think a lot of people, if they're like too close to their parents for too long, they, they don't really ever get to experience who they could truly be. That makes be. a lot of sense. Je Gemma tells me, cause she studied like psychology and stuff. And she says, basically, you know, when we're younger, our we rely on our parents for survival. If they don't look after us, we're basically dead. Mm -hmm. And so we find out how do we get love from them? Oh, they want me to act that way. And yes. exactly what you're saying. Oh, okay. That's, yes. I don't beatbox around mum and dad. You know? Wow. That explains it, dude. We rely yeah. on them for survival. So we act how they want us to act. But then as we grow up, you know, we still have that kind of relationship with them. So it doesn't really change that's really interesting so i guess maybe if there's any parents listening i i don't know how how parents could like help foster the kid to be however they want to be maybe it's just a maybe the parent just straight up has to tell the kid like i don't know what it is like does the, is the parent supposed to be like hey act how you want or just not maybe like discipline the kid for acting how they want i'm not really sure it's hard. I, I wouldn't like to um, I wouldn't like to chime in because I don't have kids and I, it must be a really, really tough job. And I think I'll be such an overprotective dad. I think I'd be rubbish at it. But um, yeah, yeah. Children should be able to explore what they want to be and what they want to do and find their joy. You know, that's I think for what I would say, a lot of people say, I don't know what my joy is. Yeah. I say, well, you haven't tried enough things yet. You're, so your purpose in life right now is to try all the things until right. you get something that you can't stop thinking about and doing and you know that brings you energy etc yeah another another way to find out what you really want to do i think is um because a lot of people you're right they can't answer that question i like to mm. ask people like if you had to do the same thing every day for the next five years what would you want to do every day and a lot of people can't answer that some people they for sure boom i want to do this and they they, they can it's easy for them, but other people, they're like, oh, I'm not sure. So I think one way to answer that too is like, use, use the, the law of opposites and be like, what do I not want to do? Okay. And then what's the opposite of that? So mm. what do I not want to do? I don't want to work for someone. Okay. So you want to work for yourself. Amen. I, do, I don't <laughs> want to, um, you know, I don't want to be in this cold country. Okay. So you want to be in the tropics, you know? I don't want to have this, this gut ache. Okay. So you want good digestion, right? So now we're yeah. clear. We want good digestion. You want to be in the tropics. You want to work for yourself. Now we're getting somewhere, right? That so a lot of sense. people, they, they are clear on what they don't want, but they're not clear on what they do want. And no one's ever told them to just, you know, look at the opposite of what you don't want. Yeah. And it's really that. obvious when you spell it out, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It's super obvious. The best things are simple. I think. Yeah, man. Mm. So, uh, you said you, you, you know, you said Gemma's helping you with the business and you're creating content. What is it exactly that you help people with online? Um, I think we're kind of, um, kind of multifaceted. So just basically how to, how to be vegan and why to be vegan, um, how to do it healthfully. So the, the importance of, a uh, predominantly whole foods plant-based diet versus vegan junk foods and things and also so there's the health aspect and also just the sports performance and physique side so my background is as a PT um, and as a nutritionist so I'm kind of leveraging those two things so uh, and just I want the world to be vegan I want to just put the facts out there so I help them find 
I help them connect with their higher self because no one would, no one in their right mind would want to harm an animal unnecessarily. But we've just been taught that it's normal, natural, and necessary. So, yeah, I guess I'm three pronged really: helping people to go vegan, uh, helping people to go to be healthy as a vegan, and helping people to be big and ripped as a vegan. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's me. Sweet man, and and like. How did you initiate this journey into what you're doing now? Because I know there's a lot of people watching or listening and they're like, I want to do that too. But, and then they insert a hundred excuses here and yeah. valid excuses, but I don't have the audience, but I don't think anyone would listen to me, but I don't think anyone would buy from me, but Paul already knows more than me, but so-and-so is better looking than me. Right. And they instantly come up with like a hundred. Sure in their mind, valid reasons not to do it. How did you just do it? Despite having probably yeah. those same five reasons. I mean, you know, I, I was scared of broadcast. I had, I was useless with tech. I didn't have the equipment. It just to be honest, initially it was accidental. Just, I, I was a PT at the time and I, and I wanted a resource where people, my clients can see about exercise form and what type of protein can I eat as a vegan? What sort of meals can I eat? It was really a resource for my clients, um, but it just started to grow. And so I, would, I wouldn't even describe it as a side hustle. It was just something I did to help my clients. And, and it was a little bit of fun for me. Um, but because of, I think of my passion and my drive and the fact that I kept doing it because I was enjoying doing it, it just naturally grew of its own volition. So, um, yeah, just very, very lucky, really. And just through doing it, you know, I was discovering, oh, how do I use Photoshop? How do I edit videos? I, I was a self-starter. Instead of being like this thick schoolboy who couldn't learn anything, I was seeking, you know, <laughs> Everything you want to know is on YouTube, isn't it? You just type in, oh, how how do I edit in Premiere Pro? And it's all there. And if if you're if you're motivated enough, you'll do it. If you found your joy, you you will make yourself do it and you'll be a self-starter. And I think, you know, we've all got, you know, most people are in the grind, aren't they? The nine to five, and we have to earn money mostly. So, but we've all got 24 hours in the day, you know. So if we're eight hours at work, there's 16 hours. Of course, we need to sleep, but just put some time aside start a side hustle bit and I think you know with the advent of um you know uh, the internet and, and having an online presence there's never been a better time has there you know it's uh anyone could you just need an iPhone really and uh you can do it too it's just getting started being brave getting started and learning as you go and um over time you know over time I managed to stop doing the PT stuff and then over time I managed to stop doing the the coaching which would take me like a day or two writing up plans for people and now I just make my money you know making content and attaching my my video my um books and and my online course to it right and um yeah it took time it took a little time it took I would say five years to get really comfortable and to be able to to confidently do it as a as a full-time job basically uh, if you knowing what you know now like having everything set up and making the money you're making now if you could go back five years and tell yourself something five years ago to speed up the process or mm. make the process a lot easier for you what would you tell yourself mm, that's a really good question yeah start with some digital products from the word go because you know we've had eight eight and a half million video views today and i only started doing digital products like the last couple of years so I've missed out on about 6 million opportunities. Exactly what I tell everyone. Dude. <laughs> That's the biggest thing. Exactly what I tell everyone. Like build the product first and then build your audience around that product. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Good. That, that was... that, that's, a, that's a solid tip. So yeah. um, the word hench herbivore, like where did you get that name from? Oh, someone uh, called me it. So do you have the word hench in Canada? We have the word henchman. Henchman, yeah. So it's sort of from from that. It basically it means like um, like a bodybuilder physique, like big muscles, like quite lean. Yeah, hench, hench, jacked, yoked, okay. all those kind of words. And and so this was before I was a PT. In fact, uh, before I was on YouTube, I was in the gym. I had a big pump on, and I'd actually got a bit bored of bodybuilding. I'd been doing it um, for about twenty eight years at that point. Uh, and I was getting a bit bored of it. 
And but one day I, I was training away because it's part of my life. It's something that I always do just for the, the health side of it. And someone said, wow, like I had a big pump and they said, wow, you look like a hench herbivore. No and that, way. Just sounded, that just sounded nice in my ears. No way. Someone said that that. So, so then when I became a vegan PT, that was my uh, my company. Uh, well, name were were you herbivore. wearing a shirt that said herbivore? How did they know you were an herbivore? Um, well, I was vegan. So, of course, uh, I'll tell everyone I'm vegan all oh, the time, yeah, as, the, as the joke goes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh. Um, so, dude, you got you got a big gig coming up, dude. Ten thousand people potentially in a, in a crowd at the vegan campout. Uh, how did how did you score that gig? Um, just through um, just having the the presence, I guess, and 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 people seem to like what what we do, and um, yeah, I, I actually did speak there um, two or three years back. Um, I was in this little side sort of thing. Um, I spoke to about 500, um, but it was packed out. All, all the talks I've done, I've not done many, and they've been quite small, but they've always been packed out. And um, yeah, yeah, they just approached me and said, oh, do you want to be on the main stage? And my initial thought was, no freaking way. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. But then I thought, this is too important. This is bigger than my ego. Like my ego says, oh, no, don't do that. You might mess it up. You might get embarrassed. But, you know, I feel like I can save a lot of animals, you know, if um, if I could be my size and strength and be vegan, obviously anyone can be vegan. And I need to I ate a lot of animals, Ted. I ate I used to eat 500 grams of animal protein a day. You know, I would eat 10 kilos of chicken breasts every week. I drink 42 pints of milk, tuna, egg, steak. I must have eaten and been responsible for the death of, of just thousands of animals over my lifetime. And when I didn't know better and. I need to um, undress the balance. And if I can save more animals than I had put to death, then I think that's the best I can do with my life, really. What do you, what do you, think's, the, uh, what do you think's the biggest difference between trying to grow muscles on a plant-based diet versus trying to grow muscles on a meat-eating or animal-based diet? nothing really nothing for me it's a little harder in terms of muscle growth because i try to eat a healthy vegan diet so i'm eating mostly legumes whole grains fruits vegetables you know a lot of calories a lot of sorry not many calories but more water and fiber so i have to eat a big volume so to do it in a healthy way yeah that's a bit more difficult than doing it omnivorously because obviously meat and cheese etc is, is a lot more calorically dense Mm -hmm. um but you could be vegan you could bodybuild you could just drink protein shakes you could just swallow oil down and you could eat table sugar so you'd have like the bill and take a vitamin supplement like you'd still do it um i would wager that your life would be short and, and end in a lot of dysfunction and disability and uh i don't I can't imagine you'd be very happy but you could do it but so even I can do it as, as someone needing up to 5,000 calories a day as a whole foods vegan. I have a couple of protein shakes, but mostly I eat the whole foods. If I can do it, like I said, anyone can do it. And there's no excuse. And there's benefits, you know, I have more energy. I recover better. Uh, my tendonitis went away. I used to have screaming tendonitis. It used to keep me out of the gym for like three weeks at a time. Um, it's been nothing, nothing but a benefit to my sports performance. And the science has come out now. Uh, there was a study of Sao Paulo University last year, uh, and it was the best ever study on vegan versus omnivorous bodybuilding. And they found no difference in the ability to build muscle or build size. Uh, and the lead re researcher has gone vegan off the back of it. He was not vegan before the start of the um, experiment. He is now. And um, it's all there. The old, you know, we used to say, plant-based protein is not as good but we based that science on some just some dodgy science this pcas and ds scores the proteins were not varied enough they were just feeding and even and it was either in rats or in pigs well we're not rats or pigs it was either it was just like one type of protein like maybe it was just soybeans maybe it was just one type of legume well any healthy person has eaten a range of different plant foods to get the balance of essential amino acids and in one of those studies they didn't even cook the stuff they were giving it to the animals raw well who eats raw beans and raw like grains no we cook them which frees up the amino acids and yeah the science shows 
there's about a one to two percent difference. Supposedly, uh, animal protein is about one to two percent more bioavailable than plant protein. But there's negatives to animal protein that you don't get in plants. And the net result is, as that study showed, no difference in the ability to grow muscle and strength. And I postulate, while we're younger, we can get away with eating any old junk. But into middle and older age, we're seeing the vegan athletes now, like breaking away from the pack. Maybe a lot of these omnivorous eaters are dropping off because they're getting pains, they're getting heart disease. You know, we need a good blood supply to to exercise. And um, I think I'm, I, I have bet my life that uh, uh, mostly whole foods vegan diet is superior for health, longevity, and even better for sports performance, in my view. Yeah. What What are your? Uh, I'm I'm just I'm just trying to think about what the um, devil's advocates are going to be typing in the comments. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts on anti nutrients on a vegan diet? So there's anti nutrients in all foods. Uh, there's lectins in uh, dairy. So if anyone's saying we shouldn't eat uh, beans or brassicas or grains, well then you shouldn't be eating dairy because there's lectins in dairy as well. There's avidin in eggs, which binds B vitamins. There's, um, oh, what is that? Stuff? Uric acid, you know, which is an anti-nutrient. The science of these anti-nutrients. And again, a lot of these studies were faulty. Um, the lectin stuff, no, phytates. Phytates, if you don't eat phytates regularly, they do act as an anti-nutrient. They, they bind minerals. But for humans... If we then include phytates, and we should be including phytates because they're in healthy foods. Like spinach? Oh, yeah. Um, spinach, that, that's uh, oxalates is high oh, in oxalates. spinach. But um, they're, they're all uh, in all the different foods. And um, phytates, actually, once you've been eating them for a while, your body finds homeostasis. It learns to deal with that and not for that to be a, an anti-nutrient. And in fact, Dr. Gregor of Nutrition Facts, says it should be reclassified as a vitamin, perhaps call it vitamin P, and it does all the things that vitamins do. So uh, we don't produce it. When we eat it, the amount in our bloodstream goes up. When we don't have enough, we can have disease states. When we eat it and we have it in the body, it can deal with those disease states. It's a vitamin. It is a vitamin in humans. Beagles and rat studies from the 1920s, yeah, it hurt them. We're not beagles, we're not rats, and we change <laughs> relative to our the foods we eat. And um, yeah, o oxalates, we can have a, a moderate amount of oxalates and be fine. That's, that's the one in um, spinach, as you mentioned. We have um, bacteria in our gut. If you've got a healthy gut, you can deal with a lot of things, as you well know. And we have a bacteria called Oxalobacter fermentase that eats oxalates. It's in, it, the, and when you feed these good gut bugs, they create you know, they train our immune system, they create vitamins, they create short chain fatty acids, which are the bedrock of our health. Uh, they do nothing but good things for us. And um, yeah, it's nonsense. And, you know, if we look at one aspect, if we look at so-called anti-nutrients, you know, you know, lectins, some lectins are harmful, some are anti-cancer. You get a tiny bit of lectins in beans. Most of it is killed by the cooking process and no one's eating raw beans because you break your teeth. But um where was I going with that? Yeah, if you look at the, if you go down into the weeds and look at reductionist science, you'll always come up with problems. For instance, there's apparently a compound in garlic, which causes, is, uh, cast, is um, mutagenic, it can cause cancers. But if we snap back, look at the bigger picture, well, what happens when people eat, um, when people actually eat garlic? Oh, it's one of the most anti-cancer thing you can eat. You know, oh, there's lectins in, in um, legumes and whole grains but what do the people in the blue zones eat they all eat they all eat these lectin rich foods yet they're the longest lived people on the planet so don't look at reduction as science i mean it's good to like know these things but then look at the bigger picture what happens in actual populations no these are the longest lived people on the planet and we want to be eating more of these foods i, I think the blue zone study said for every two tablespoons of legumes which is high in lectins uh 8% less chance of an early death for two tablespoons. Get your bean, don't, oh, there's just bro science. People yeah. want to hear good news about their bad habits. They look at these cheery pick silly little studies that are bad science and they want to run with it because it, it, you know, proves that they're, they're biased, confirms their horrible bias. But no, look at the longest of people in the world. The longer, happier health you live, that is correlated with eating more whole plant foods. And if you want to shorten your life, you know, eat everything but plant foods. And the fact is, we talked about gut microbiome. 
the gut microbiome, you know, there's the biggest um, advances in nutrition in the, in the last, like, maybe 16 years. And it shows when we feed Prevotella strains, and these eat fiber, uh, resistant starch, and they benefit from polyphenols. As I say, these create um, vitamins, they boost the immune system, they make short chain fatty acids. 99% of the genes that control our health destiny is relevant to these bacteria that live in our gut, predicated on what we eat. So if, if you want to live a long life, feed the Prevotella strains. If you're not worried and you want to eat pathogenic uh, bacteria promoting foods, yeah, eat your animal products, eat, eat refined sugar, you know, take your medications, drink alcohol. And, you know, 1% of our genes control our health destiny. 99% of the genes belong to these bacteria. So it's that important. And you take your pick. <laughs> what, what do you want? Do you want to be healthy or no? <laughs> I thought I knew quite a bit about nutrition, but you clearly know a lot more <laughs> about nutrition. Where can people find out more about what exactly they should be eating from you? Like, do you have a, a, a you said you have a book and you have a course, right? That, yeah, so we've got a course out. Can... It's a real deep dive. It's basically my knowledge from 10 years as a PT nutritionist, it's Gemma's knowledge as a um, nutritionist, as a uh, chef. So, we, oh, sorry, my screen just went bonkers and I got thrown off my train of thought. Um, our cookbook, we've got three cookbooks as well there for sale, but they're in the course as well. Uh, and the course has 14 videos, real deep dive. We've also got a free guide at the top there, Ted. Download my free vegan nutrition e-guide. That's a complete overview. It's a PDF. Sweet. So that's for free. That's everything, um, all the basics you need to know. But we've got a course, we've got our cookbooks. And we've got our uh, free videos on YouTube and uh, can people just like book a private one-on-one session with you? Do you offer that? Um, Yeah, I've started to, it's that there's a link in my, uh, underneath my YouTube videos is a link for that, but we are going to do, as you know, we're going to start up real uh, one-on-one hands-on hand holding coaching so I'll only be working with a very select few people because I won't have the time. I mostly want to be making content. But I want to see some people at ground zero and they want to boost their health. They want to grow muscle. They want to burn fat. Whatever it is, I want them to really thrive, work with them for 12 weeks, one-on-one, weekly check-ins, give them a game plan. And uh, I want to document and show like, yeah, you can be vegan and you can have the best health and you don't have to eat animals. You don't have to wreck the planet for our, our children and our children's children. And uh, that's coming soon. That's coming soon. Dude, you know <laughs> so much about nutrition. It's crazy. Like even Thank this you. little stuff, like I don't recommend the omega-3 test as in terms of omega-3, it only measures EPA, not ALA or DHA. So it doesn't give a full picture. I was just having a call yesterday with my friend and like, dude, you got to get the omega-3 test. And I'm like, well, that sounds kind of cool. But now boom, you're like, yeah. Hey, I don't even recommend it because of this. Like, yeah there's so much info out there man and uh i think speaking with someone like you could or even just listening to someone like you like people going through watching your videos like they would probably learn so much about about nutrition so That's very thank, kind. thank you thank for you. all you do man and uh, uh and edu- likewise educating the masses bro yeah i uh, think yeah, uh i i I, I wish I wish we had more time. I could probably talk to you for another hour, but we got to bounce. But um, likewise, it's been a lot of fun, Ted. This was uh, this was a good one, man. You're like, as, as soon as we start talking about nutrition, your brain starts going a mile a minute, and it's like, bam, yeah, bam, 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 I've bam, got bam, too bam, bam, many bam. things to say. I sort of get scared that I'm gonna forget. Like, there's so many things I could say, and what do people need to know or want to know? And am yeah. I gonna lose track because I've got so many roads well, I could go down? But that worked out fine. There's. <sighs> certain people who appreciate science, right? And there's other, there's most people who just appreciate a good story, mm. right? So you could talk about all the AHA and DPL and OFA and whatever, like <laughs> whatever the words are. You're teaching me something now, Ted. I've never even heard of those. <laughs> <laughs> I just made them up. Um, you know, like oxalates and lectins and antinutrients and all that, right? And like, sure, there's a science to back some things up, but Most people are never going to remember the science. They're not even going to understand the science. Mm -hmm. But if they hear a story about someone who was on their deathbed, eating garbage, discovering a vegan diet, and now being on the cover of men's magazine, looking super healthy, like that is like the thing that makes them go like, wow. Amen. So um, 
although the science is cool, it's like you also have a you also have a, a really badass story, and I think it's important for you to get that story out there and, and tell a lot of people Thank what you. you're not just yeah. your story, but Gemma's story and all your client stories, because um, yeah, it's the story that really, really, really inspires people, right? Yeah, um, and then the science yeah. can explain why that story was able to you know occur. So yeah, very true, very true, and I'm learning that from you, Ted. And and thank you for all you do. You know, you're saving people, you're saving the planet, you're saving the animals, and you saved me from possibly. I'm not sure that I could have continued because you know YouTube's getting tougher now. Um, I think the vegan niche is so, um, you know, so busy now. Like it, it, it's, um, you know, views views are kind of going down across the board, and and I may have had to stop doing this for a living. I may have had to get a a uh, uh, boring nine to five where i can't save the people the planet and the animals if it wasn't for your kind coaching um that may well have happened and um so i'm so grateful to you like you you really saved us so i won't let it happen dude yeah oh, you're yeah. one of the good ones ted you're such a good guy i'm i'm so grateful that the universe uh put us together thank you so yeah. much sweet well dude thanks so much for the the call again i wish we could speak longer but i've got to bounce uh Let's uh, let's connect again soon. And uh, yes, please. Oh, are you on the tonight? Aren't you? A couple of hours time is no one hour's time. Yeah, we're doing we gotta, your, uh, we gotta yeah, we're gonna we're gonna come in on the uh, group uh, chat. The group coaching. All right, man. Yeah. Sounds good. So I'll see you there. All right, Paul. <laughs> take care. Thanks a lot. And uh, ciao for now. Peace. One love, brother. One see love, you soon. Later.